This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name is Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, a spotlight on successful outcomes and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver a highly effective, customized, and engaging learning experience for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hello, everyone. My name is Ladik, and my guest for today is Dr. Monique Vani, who is a Senior Engagement Manager for the Strive Community, a project supported by the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, and the Director of Research for Caribou Digital, which implements the Strive Community. In this engaging conversation, Monique and I talk about the relationship between Caribou, Strive, and MasterCard, and the goals of the global program that they have going on. We also talk about the successes and challenges of managing the Strive community remotely, including some archetypes for people who thrive in virtual communities and the challenges of training junior staff. Monique also discusses how Strive provides supports to its community of small and medium-sized enterprises who aren't necessarily digitally savvy through a network of partners and the challenges of engaging new organizations digitally. Monique also provides examples of best and worst case implementation of remote training provided to partners. And there's a a shout out to TechnoServe for some great design learning content that she calls out. We also talk about how Strive is enabling leapfrog moments for their partners so that they can actually skip multiple steps in their evolution to delivering digitally to their constituents. We then move on to talking about the importance of agility in innovation and growing when with with funding sources and partners are more institutional or rigid so you know government funding partners or you know maybe older funding partners and why there might be a real generational issue that needs to be addressed when it comes to the humans that you're dealing with and then finally we end our talk with a conversation around to LMS or not to LMS, to, you know, to use a learning management system or not, and the many flavors and varieties of delivering learning virtually. And remember, we record this podcast live so that we can interact with you, our listeners, in real time. So if you'd like to join the fun every week on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, just come over to elearnmagazine.com and subscribe. Now, I give you Monique. Dr. Monique Vani, right now, how are you today? Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Good. Where, where, um, where are you sitting? I'm sitting in my living room, uh, behind this gallery wall, which I think looks cool for. I see David Bowie. I can't yeah. see much else though. Who else? Who, what else is back there? Uh, we've got some fine art photography, some cool. posters, some paintings, a bit of everything. Fantastic. Nice. So I'm based in São Paulo, Brazil. Okay. Beautiful sunny day over here. Wonderful, and I'm coming from Mexico City, Mexico. Oh, amazing! I lived in Mexico City. Oh, well, which part did you live in? In Polanco. Uh, of course, that's that's most of where I live. Cool. So, are are you Brazilian? Yes. Oh, I was reading your LinkedIn profile, and I didn't. I, Bra- Brazilian did not come across. <laughs> well, I have a very the... British education, right? That's why I guess maybe I thought you were British. In a disguise. But... The mid-Atlantic accent is what I'm told, which is like messy American, sometimes more British, just discombobulated accent. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's find out. Super cool. Um, you are a part of the Strive Foundation, and that's what we're going to be talking about here on the podcast. Yes? Yes. So the Strive Community. Sorry, Strive Community, which is a part of the MasterCard Foundation or funded by the MasterCard Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. So the Strive Community is a program that is managed by Caribou Digital, which is a small boutique focused on digital inclusion uh, based out of nowhere. So we're completely remote and we have been given this pro- program to manage worldwide. So everywhere except uh, North America by the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Okay. All right. 
is the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, is it part of the MasterCard Foundation? No, they're separate. So interestingly enough, the MasterCard Foundation now is no longer connected to MasterCard and it has become its own thing. Mm -hmm. So they, they've kept the name, but it's no longer connected to MasterCard, whereas the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth is actually the philanthropic arm of MasterCard, the business. So there is a close connection and we rely a lot on MasterCard, the business to kind of, you know, find partners and scale things and, and, and things like that. Well, just, I even noticed in the, in the Strive community that, you know, the orange and red circles coming together were there. That was like the first tip off. I think that's pretty a nice. That's a nice co-branding there. Yeah, it's nice. We have to be careful, even from a legal perspective, that the branding is MasterCardy, but not too MasterCardy. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. So, you know, this is the eLearn podcast. And so my, my, my really cool, like, like my first question is like, you're a virtual organization. Caribou is a virtual organization. The community is a virtual community. Tell me how, how you manage that. Right. So, so many of the people who are listening or will listen to this conversation either work remotely or learn remotely or teach remotely. And yes. so, what has what you know what have been the biggest challenges and and that you've had or that you've been facing um that the community is either currently overcoming or has found a way to navigate that you know that you know is able to bring people in and feel like they're engaged and feel like they're a part of something i think i'll be honest with you i find that remote work works really well for a certain type of profile of people and so mm -hmm. i think remote organizations end up kind of repeating a type right of people that come in and and do well whereas other people struggle so i think there's there's just it's just self-selecting in many ways of, of who's going to make it and who's not and unfortunately the biggest challenge that i find is training junior staff mm. because if you're a senior professional and you kind of you know what you're doing and you know what you need to get done then you're going to get your tasks you're going to have your calls and you're just going to you know plow through your day and 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 you know like you'll know when to ask for help i think one of the biggest challenges with junior staff is they want to solve everything and they don't know when to ask for help or, you know, when they get stuck. <clears throat> and when you're face to face with someone, it's a lot easier to kind of, you know, push through those bottlenecks really fast and training junior staff remotely, I find really difficult. And that's something that we struggle with. So we end up being, you know, like a bunch of very senior people mm. um, uh, working together. I think that's the biggest challenge. And uh, otherwise we've, we've always been virtual, right? So we haven't had a transition in COVID. Um, so we're just set up to work like that. Yeah. And as I said, I think we're just, we just recruit people who have experience working remotely and who do well. So who does, so then let's change the perspective to the organizations that the Strive Foundation serves. Yes. And talk to me about though, like, so what is it that you deliver to those organizations or the support that you provide? And, and then we can go from there. Okay, so what we do is we have a fund that we manage, that is the Strive Community Fund, and we find grantees. And the way the program works is we will find in a particular market somebody who knows how to work with MSEs, which is our target audience, so small businesses with less than 10 employees, knows what kind of support they need and knows how to engage them, knows how to work with them. We will help them build out a program and then look for scale partners, which are partners who have large-scale digital access to MSCs to then push those programs through. So what we do is we orchestrate those partnerships and then we help them manage the program so that they can deliver. And I think the biggest challenge is a lot of these organizations that we're working with have massive experience working with our target audience but are not digital native organizations. Mm -hmm. So the process of uh like you will see like the content we've created and the videos and things like that but the process of pushing these organizations to work in a new way so that they can think digital produce digital content produce digital content that makes sense for digital channels is the biggest challenge and i think that's the biggest differential and the reason why caribou is there as a buffer between mastercard and those grantees is to upskill them and help them change the way they think so that they can change the way they deliver programs because mm international development and kind of this kind of community support organization, the way of working is still very much the same that it was 30 years ago. So that digital disruption within the process is really a challenge and really where we spend most of our time. So how are you delivering that upskilling? 
And, you know, so, I mean, it, that's, I guess that's our, that's our wheelhouse here in this podcast is, yeah, you know, I, not only scale but that's, that's, you know, provided by the advent of digital, you know, of online learning and those yeah. kinds of things, but also the eff effectiveness. So take me, I mean, like the most basic questions, do you have like, okay, Hey, we've just signed you up, you know, community support organization or community development organization or financial inclusion organization or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and you're, you know, look, I mean, do they even have access? Are, are you working with communities that even have sort of bandwidth and access and, you know, sort of, you know, a, a strong enough pipe that you, you can deliver this stuff I effectively? So, it, yes. And we pre-select, right? So we, this is a constant challenge and I, I've worked in international development all my life. You want to help the most vulnerable but you have programs and initiatives that are not going to help the most vulnerable. You're wasting your resources if you try to fix something that is unfixable. So you have to make sure that you scope it right. And we are scoping micro entrepreneurs that already have access to, 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 you know, minimum digital access. And in a sense, COVID was a great boost, right? Because everybody went online. So what we're dealing with now is a population worldwide of MSCs that are already, you know, on WhatsApp trading and kind of, you know, even if rudimentarily, you know, using uh, digital tools for their businesses. So we're actually coming in a, in a stratum of population that is already online. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to then use that opportunity to change the ways these support organizations are working. So to give you some practical kind of uh, uh, nuggets, uh, one thing that we find, for example, is every development project starts with a needs assessment, right? Oh, yeah. Now, <laughs> Right. Yeah. So what do they need? What are they using? You know, how do we reach them now? If you're going to do something digital, you have to start thinking very much from kind of a design thinking lens and you have to think, what is the content that I'm going to design? How am I going to deliver it? What is the impact that I need to have? Because we're looking for behavior change, right? I just, mm -hmm. my, my KPI is not have they watched the video, but have they adopted a digital tool? Have they improved their income? So I need this to, you know, percolate and be used. And you need to think backwards about, you know, what is the content that I'm going to design? What do I need? You know, what is my learning trajectory? How does my learning trajectory maybe intersect with other program activities and things like that? And you need to really use a design thinking lens to create that needs assessment to make sure that you, you get the inputs that you need. And so already, perhaps uh, the most uh, overarching theme that we get across our programs, and we're working in every continent with a variety of grantees, is that the needs assessment is a struggle for everyone because it's already mm. a completely different way of doing things because i need to know how long does that video need to need to be do you have you know uh does the video need to come to you through an lms do you need to be able to download it where you have wi-fi so that you can watch it later mm -hmm. uh you know uh what is the look and feel that you need you know a lot of these design elements that people are really used to thinking about when they're you know scoping out their audiences are crucial to our design because you guys know you guys are specialists in this you can't force somebody to look at a screen mm -hmm. they have to be interested right? right and a lot of traditional development is like oh we're going to do a training and then you know like there's a social capital and kind of like physical uh proximity incentive for people to come to the training and to listen and then they'll get a coffee break and they'll hang out and things like that and so it's a lot easier to kind of corral your audience into a room and upskill them like that. Mm -hmm. But if you skill them digitally, you're going to have to create something that's sufficiently interesting for them to take time of their, out of their busy lives and sit with you remotely on their phone to look at your content. So you have to be really sharp in how you assess those needs. So give me, give me a best case. We love this sexy example and this one fell flat and, you know, we, we really missed the, you know, like we swung and we, we just completely missed it from, from what the strive has done over the last year or so. Without naming names, obviously. <laughs> no, yeah. No, you don't have to call you. I'm not trying to call you out. I'm just like, I'd like, we like to work, you know, I'd like, like, cause so many times we think we have a formula for, I, I know how we're going to make this engaging. And yet what we actually find is, no, we just needed to deliver at 5 p.m. because that's when everybody gets off work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, and so I'm just wondering what have you found, especially because you're working in contexts that many people who are listening right now just don't even think about, right? Like, 
I'm fortunate to have that experience, but that, that's what I'm so like when I'm delivering to Uganda or Tanzania or Cambodia, it's, it's just a different thought process. So what, what have you found? Like, I'd love to hear just like, this was unexpected and this killed it. Or maybe you do have a formula that works. I don't know. You tell me. I think uh, from, and I'm, we're starting, some of our stuff is going live now and a lot of it is kind of down the pipeline. So we don't have that much experience in what has worked other than the AB testing and the general testing. But I think in general, where we've done best is where we have created a program around a very specific local need with a partner that really knows their audience. Mm. And where we haven't done well is when we've been like, let's do this thing because it seems interesting. And like, we feel from the literature that we should be investing in this. And then we totally tanked because, <laughs> because there's a lot of competition for attention out there. And I mean, even partners who have like those scale partners that I mentioned before, who have access to those MSCs, they don't want something prepackaged that they're going to distribute. They want mm. something that they feel is really tailored. So I think that's the biggest uh, uh, takeaway so far. And one thing that we found very difficult also is adapting content across regions. So mm. even me, though- we, What's a concrete example of that? Like what's so what, a have, piece of content? So we have a really, really good e-commerce toolkit that was created for us uh, by TechnoServe, which is an amazing partner they have. Mm. If you look at our blog, that's a really good resource for people to look at is how they design the content and their whole A-B testing strategy is really well described in there. I think that's a really worthwhile piece of work to look at. They did an amazing job and they created characters that we thought are, you know, very kind of global looking. And I have trouble getting my Southeast Asia counterpart to adopt that content because she feels like, well, this guy looks a bit too Indian. He doesn't look Southeast Asian enough. Are people mm -hmm. going to be into it? So, yeah, I mean... You have to be really sharp with with um, with virtual content if you're you know trying to gain some bandwidth on people's days. Mm. That's what we found. So a lot of times we have to reshoot some videos and things like that to make sure that we get somebody that people identify with on the screen. What um so going a little deeper on that, have you found as well that there is, for lack of a better term, a generational gap? where you know the expectations maybe of leadership uh you know in some of these organizations and what works is one thing and then maybe what uh, you know let's say people who are five years younger or 10 years younger who maybe are either getting delivered to or the programs are coming to them or whatever um it, you know it kind of either falls flat or misses it or, or you know as the kids say these days is a little cringy um <laughs> So one yeah. thing that I talk about a lot is uh, organizational psychology in the context of, of digital innovation. And mm -hmm. it, it seems a bit fuzzy to people, but if you are in the in kind of the, in, the, in the hot seat trying to get things across and trying to get things done, how decisions are made and how resistant organizations are to change is really a key factor of the outcome that you're going to get. So getting people to work differently uh, is the biggest challenge that I have in my day-to-day -day life. And yes, there is a generational gap, um, but also there's a lack of tried, tested, and kind of institutionalized new ways of working in, in the impact sector. Mm -hmm. So there is not, there's a very kind of like tried and tested formula for program development, implementation, and upskilling that people have been using since the 60s, really. And... The new way of working isn't institutionalized. So people mm. scramble, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that, that impacts outcomes. And that, that is what is going to impact the quality of the video at the end of my program, basically. So do you have a, so one of the things that I, I found quite a bit in my career in, in international development was there's, there are leapfrog moments, right? So you, and that sounds kind of like what you're describing right here. And so what, have you witnessed those or are you trying to enable those, you know, kind yeah. of may, maybe be a catalyst for those where it's like, look, we don't have to go step by step. We can actually go from A to A to F. Uh, That's you know? exactly what we're trying to do. And I think one thing that um, really stifles innovation in, in, in the sector is the fact that program cycles and the funding 
thing is so overly structured. It's like a Soviet five-year plan, right? Like on year four, I'm going to have this workshop. And do you know what I mean? Like you approve a I think program. You want to say, I think you say Chinese these days, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's so super structured. How do you create an innovation approach for a project that has such specific KPIs and activities and budgets? Like you need to have real flexibility with your donor to go and say, hey, this tanked. We're not going to do this anymore. I was yesterday I was in a call. We have an innovation fund. So in addition to uh, a lot of the upskilling that we're doing, we have programs that combine upskilling with tool adoption. We have a really cool program in Brazil that's doing upskilling, tool adoption, gamification, credit delivery. So there's a there's a funnel in that direction. We're testing a lot of approaches so that we can find those new pathways also. So a lot of a lot of it is experimentation and we have an innovation fund. Uh, that we've granted, I think, eight grantees worldwide. It's a million dollar fund for them to create a new tool or solution to support the digitalization of these MSCs. And yesterday I was with one of our grantees doing an update call and they're like, listen, this is our needs assessment. We've done this. We've an analyzed the value chain. This is our pesto analysis. We've done this and this and that. Actually, what we submitted to you isn't going to work. We're going to pivot and do something completely different. Mm. Mm. And I was like, awesome <laughs> let's sure. do it you know like but you're gonna have to research again and you like think of this and things like that and i'm totally accommodating to that if you're talking to usa they're gonna be like no <laughs> this yeah. isn't what i signed up for do you know what i mean so that also needs to change is that relationship with how the money flows so that people can accept failures and uh iterate and you know do a lot of the cool stuff that kind of the new ways of working promote hmm. Do you, have you found that there is a a threshold or a size where that agility becomes, you know, less uh, less able for lack of you know? I, I, and the, the genesis of, of what my thinking is here or whatever is, it's one thing to talk to a as you said your your target audience is you know SMEs that are ten people right yeah I mean if I'm that you can put all of those people in a room. And they can work together and, you know, kind of everybody wears one or maybe two hats, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, it's easy to kind of just say, look, let's have an all hands meeting and, you know, we're, we're pivoting this way or, you know, and easy to communicate. But at some stage, you become an organization that's large enough where you have teams and you have a management layer and you have those things. And so we, that's where we start to find rigidity in organizations. Is there, have you, have you discovered at least maybe in your career or with the found, you know, with the, the community and, and the, the work that you're doing, is there a moment or can agility be pre preserved or I'm just going to drop it right there and let you talk. I think agility can be preserved. I've talked, I've just finished a, co a program at MIT. That's, that's a, an innovation program. We've talked about this a lot. I think agility can and needs to be preserved, right? We're at a, we're at a moment where I was reading yesterday that uh, medical knowledge duplicates every four years now. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. so Duplicates just, or doubles? Uh, doubles. Yeah. Mm. So it doubles every four years. Uh, so, I mean, the, the era is digital, digital transformation and, you know, change is constant. So you have to, right? Or you die or you're Blackberry. Um, but <laughs> Which is still a company, by the way. <laughs> what are they selling? Blackberries? Uh, <laughs> Leg legacy, legacy contracts. I don't know. Uh, but... Um, I think what matters is, and again, I go back to organizational psychology, you're going to create innovation teams and they all do create innovation teams. All of the larger companies now know that they have to have like these innovation cells within them. Mm -hmm. The question is how willing is leadership to then scale innovation and work with what comes out and, you know, reshape things and, you know, go through the pains of, of redoing things. So I, I mean, some, some companies do great at, you know, staying ahead of the curve. And I think it's those companies that aren't doing innovation kind of for show because they have to, mm -hmm. but are really letting those teams work. And I think there's an intergenerational issue. I'm going to say something awful, but you know, um, here I go. I got a lot of gray hair. It's all good. Don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, you know, the, the leadership of a company was 40, mm -hmm. you know, now the leadership of a company is almost always in their late sixties or seventies. And so, um, us Gen X have a bone to pick because we've kind of been squished out of 
of leadership positions. And I think there's a real generational uh, challenge here because a lot of the people who are still sitting on boards and making decisions in a lot of these big companies are just not digital natives anymore. So there's a really difficult engagement conversation of, you know, getting those people to think different. And because the think different is not, oh, we should adopt, adopt this CRM or we should be doing e-learning rather than this. It's not at the end but it's in the process and how the company's business model is going to adapt. And that that's a lot harder to, to digest, I think. Mm. So I think that there's a big challenge there. And I think, you know, if you look at uh, changes in AI or even in, you know, uh, uh, like the birth of quantum or IoT of things, the tech is there, you know, but we now have to play catch up as a society to let the organizations really absorb the technology and make the, the structural system change to work in a different way to make the mm -hmm. best use of it. Mm. How much of this change and how much of this adoption is personality based? Because I think it's, we can obviously talk about leadership. Um, and, but I think that we can also, we could probably find just as many good cases as we could bad cases there. I'm, I'm interested in, in your, you know, when, again, that team of 10 people, maybe 20 people, how many of them are like, look, you know, I, 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 I do great work and I'm excited about my organization, but I also just kind of want a predictable kind of nine to five. And, you know, I want to be able to come in and work with my, my clients or my, whoever my, my constituents are, right. That I'm supposed to be serving. Like how, you know, how hard is it to, to move that lever in terms of digital adoption, in terms of, again, going back to agility and, you know, so many of us are just, the, the, you know, exhausted by the pace of change. Yeah. Right. I think, well, if you're looking at a small business, I think the challenge is actually, yes, there, there's few people to change, but those people, as you said, are wearing five different hats and just, you know, like you don't have a head of HR or do you know what I mean? Like you don't have a head of this, like you don't have departments like, Oh, who's your head of, you know, corporate strategy, you know? So they're, they're very much reactive businesses. They're just, you know, right. plowing through and trying to grow, which is why the Strive community pays so much attention to, you know, what the upskilling content needs to look like and how to deliver it and things like that, because that guy is not going to go through, you know, 51 hour modules on business strategy. He wants a three minute video on how to use, you know, like a bookkeeping app. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. those guys are time crunched and, reacting. So it is really hard, I think, in a small organization. And it's, again, leadership really matters, I think. Um, so you have to be able to inspire. And I think if you're looking at slightly bigger organizations, there's a really big challenge, which is when you change the way you work, you need the type, you change the type of human resources that you use. So for example, when I worked at my previous job, which was a rural development uh, uh, focused organization, we worked with a lot of cooperatives and associations and things like that. And for example, a lot of the field officers, a lot of their job is collecting data and providing training. If that's going to be done digitally now, they're not into it because they feel like they're going to lose their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me to create a sense of safety within people that it's like, no, you're not going to lose your job, but you're now going to be spending a lot more time at the office designing content and you know building dashboards and analyzing data and we're going to upskill you so that you can transition into a new way of working that takes time mm. and there's a generation gap because that guy who's unfortunately you know I've, I've i've worked with these people you know that 60 year old guy who's an absolute monster at you know uh, delivering uh, trainings in person and things like that he's going to struggle to work in this new way and that's unavoidable mm -hmm. So take, so let's, so take me to the, um, you know, the sort of the e-learning component of this delivery that you do. How do you, you know, you know, you, you go through your design process. Ultimately you build out some kind of learning. Yes. We have everyone on this show, you know, from the most super traditional college to, uh, you know, in our, in our, uh, our summit that happened about a month ago, um, our, our, our tech session, we had, um, the head of digital learning, and which I'm screwing up his title right now, but he talked about an LMS free environment, right? They've actually started to building out their learning applications and how they deliver learning across. Uh, and this is Warner Music Global, right? This is a very large, uh, you know, well-known organization. They don't even use an LMS. 
So how do how do you guys I mean, how do you approach this, especially when you're working in low bandwidth environments and you know mostly mobile devices, mostly mobile phones, those kinds of things? Like what's what's the approach? So the to LMS or not to LMS? That is the question, right? That is a big <laughs> <laughs> um, or what or what you know what is your definition of LMS at the end of the day? That, exactly that. I think that is a better better framing mm -hmm. of the question uh, because you need you need that core stored somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean channel the interface is something else um so what we do again is everything starts with the needs assessment and with the testing so we really take an iterative approach so we'll do a needs assessment a very detailed needs assessment that's very practice oriented so like what exactly is missing and we'll do a real analysis of the context of those MSCs, what content is available what is working what isn't and so we do pilot test and iterate before we arrive at a final solution and that's crucial mm -hmm. And uh, the STRIVE program has clear objectives in terms of where it's trying to get these, these MSCs to progress to. So the content is structured again against uh, kind of three pillars, digitizing business operations, uh, accessing markets, and digital financial services, right? So that kind of gives us a framework to work with in terms of how we design content, and then we will kind of counter that with the segments of MSC that we're working with and, you know, uh, the type of skills that they need. They need. So, for example, in Latin America, what I did was I, I created a, a, a I took those MSCs and I put them in two parts. So you have these more mature MSCs, which are like, you know, uh, uh, those that have like the five to 10 to maybe 15 employees that are, uh, um, you know, operating already kind of, you know, fully formalized, which is not the case for a lot of the other MSCs and have, you know, formal employees and, you know, like have some level of structure or using some level of tools and things like that. And they're going to have completely different needs than what we call the tienditas or the mom and pop shops or technically the micro retailer, which is the guy who's just like, you know, he's got a little kiosk and he's selling online and things like that. So you really need to tailor your audience. So we have those three kind of categories and we're going to tailor what exactly they need based on that audience. And then we're really going to look at, you know, what channel makes sense, what look and feel makes sense. Do they want peer to peer learning? Do they want uh, to speak to an authority? Do they want to participate in lives? Do they want to podcast? Are they using chatbots? Are they not using chatbots? I feel like the chatbot has had like a, a, a phenomenal rise and kind of like a, you know, uh, everybody's like, forget the forget the web apps and everything. Let's all go on chatbots. And the engagement mm. rate on chatbots is, you know, good, but not also, you know, all that. So, sure. And I, well, I, I just on a like I, you, I'm sure have had this experience. Well, sometimes there is an application that's developed. that's just absolutely perfect. Yeah. When I pay, when I pay taxes, you know, on you know, through a particular chatbot, it is, it is the most seamless and fantastic experience ever. But then if I go try to get help from like a tech company, forget about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just all it is. It just feels like we're going to put up a wall and we're just going to send you some knowledge base and those kinds of things. Cause we, we, we're not, we're never, yeah, we're never really going to actually help you. Yeah. Remember like dial one for this and dial six and you're like in this maze of numbers on your phone and you're just doing the same on the chat bot. <laughs> and you're just waiting until the chat bot gets exhausted so you can talk to someone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, engagement is hard. I'm going to tell you engagement is the biggest challenge when you're not, when that person is not seeking out learning for their own improvement, but you're trying to suggest to them that upskilling is going to improve your business, engagement is the biggest challenge, which is why, for example, we're working on uh, uh, combining upskilling with uh, gamification with Flourish, which is um, a Silicon Valley based uh, gamification company, to see if we can understand the behavioral nudges and really map out the process. And that can take an MSC from unengaged to visualizing content to actually, you know, adopting one of the behaviors or tools that they were, you know, uh, upskilled to adopt. So we're, it's, it's very experimental. I have no answers at the point of, at this mm. point of what is actually going to work. And I think it's very market specific also. I mean, you have such different uh, contexts. I mean, for example, live selling is massive in Asia, right? I don't know if you know this, like they turn on these lives and they do like, they sell billions. I, li I lived in Bangkok for four years. And yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, sure. It's yeah, the pop-up, the pop-up shop is huge. Yeah. Yeah, it's tanked in Brazil. 
So mm. the contexts are widely different and it, you know, it's hard to really extrapolate lessons at this point. But um, what we're trying to do is cover our bases in terms of you know, getting the best design process possible so that we engage these audiences. Well, I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to have a conversation with me and talk about how, you know, how do we deliver learning and upskilling you know, in, in these contexts that you're working right now. I really appreciate your work and I wish you all the best. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks again for joining me for the eLearn podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Just, just push subscribe on your player right now. And remember, you can join the conversation live on YouTube, Facebook, and my LinkedIn feed every week. I hope to see you there. Thanks.